Welcome. This video is a brief introduction to the object constraint language intended to give you a bit of a start before you go and read the chapter of the standard. So the bottom line is that in this course you should be able to read and write straightforward OCL constraints, um, but I'm not expecting you to you know, completely memorise the entire language definition, of course. So what do we have in OCL? We've got a bunch of basic types. Mostly these are what you would expect. Um, by the way, I'm bracketing things that I don't expect you to know for this course. So, for example, OCL has a type of unlimited natural, but I don't expect you to know about it. Um, do know the sort of standard operations that you'd expect to have on these standardish types. Um, I think that's table 7.2 in the spec, if I haven't failed to update that. Um, one slightly surprising thing is that in OCL, integer is considered to be a subtype of real, which can be useful. We're talking about types, not classes. Um, in OCL, the terms class and type are used interchangeably. It would take us too far afield from this course to talk about why that's generally a big no-no. Um, but in this context, it's pretty much OK. Here's our first example of a typical use of OCL. It's to write a class invariant. So let's spend a bit of time with this and make sure that we understand the very simple example. So the OCL expression itself here is self.number of employees greater than 50. The line before it, context company in, is telling us something about how to interpret that OCL expression. So declaring the context to be company means that when we write self, either implicitly or explicitly, in the OCL invariant, um, that refers to an instance of class company. The inf part says that this is a class invariant. In other words, that the following constraint has to be true of every instance of class company. So one of the things we often want to be doing with OCL is to constrain what it means to be a well-formed or legitimate um, system, um, in this case a well-formed or legitimate object of class company, in ways which are hard or impossible to do diagrammatically. Uh, so in this case what we're saying is in order to be a well-formed or legitimate or correct object of class company you have to satisfy this invariant that self.number of employees is greater than 50. So for this to make sense uh, an object of class company has to have access to a linked number of employees. Now that's most likely in this case to be that the class company has an attribute number of employees. And the value of that attribute has to be greater than 50 in this particular case. Here's the other major common use of OCL. It's pre and post conditions for an operation. So here we're talking about the open operation on a class stove. Notice the double colon indicating that. And it's taking no arguments, and we're not being told what the return type is, if any. We have a precondition that status has to be oven status off. Now, what's going on here? Um, implicitly, um, status must be self.status. There's nothing else for that to mean. So we have to be talking about some status attribute of the class stove. Or conceivably, because there's no real difference between these two things in UML, we might be talking about the value of a linked object um, of, of type status, but we won't go there just for, just for the moment. Um, the capitalized oven status colon colon off indicates that oven status is an enum type and off is a member of it. So what we're saying here is that um, in order for the open operation to be invoked, it should be the case that the oven is off. The post condition um, is that the oven is still off and the is open attribute is now true. Now remember that, as so often in logical languages, it's considered, considered to be bad style to write is open equals true. We can just write is open. If is open has a Boolean type, then it is a Boolean. We just write is open, and that indicates that that is supposed to be true at the moment. Okay, so. 
As we shall see later when we talk about contracts, what's going on here is that we're saying the writer of the open method has to ensure that if the precondition holds before the operation is invoked, then the post condition will be guaranteed to, be, to hold after the operation returns. So more useful features. Um, sometimes we want to talk about the arguments and the return type of an operation in order to be able to refer to them in the um, pre and post condition. And here's the syntax for doing that. Um, this indicates that the operation foo takes an argument which we'll refer to in the OCL as i and its type is integer and that its overall return value is string. And then we can use that value i in this context. Um, incidentally, there's no reason um, why the actual name i should be the same as the name in the code. That's um, immaterial. The reserved val w word result can be also used in the post condition um, if you want to be able to talk about, about um, how the result relates to anything about the state of the instance that the method is being invoked on or anything about the arguments. Quite often we want to talk about um, how the value of an attribute will change during the course of an operation's being carried out. Um, here's the, arguably the simplest possible case. If we have an increment count operation on a class my class, then we might want to say that the post condition is that the value of the count attribute of the instance of my class is whatever it was before plus one. In other words, it really has been incremented. And this syntax count at pre is what does that. Um, count at pre is the value of the attribute before the operation was carried out. Count um, in a post condition is the value after it's been carried out. Of course, in the precondition, count will be the value before the thing has been carried out because the precondition is being evaluated before we invoke the operation. And it wouldn't make sense to be try trying in the precondition to talk about what's going to happen afterwards because it hasn't happened yet. OCL has collection types. It has a whole bunch of collection types. As before, I've bracketed the ones I don't expect you to know about. Um, set, bag, and sequence are kinds of collection. They're not going to give you any great surprises. There's a notion of conformance, and you'll find that um, set S conforms to collection T if S conforms to T. Think about that for a moment, but it does kind of make sense. OCL gives us reasonable facilities for manipulating collections, and here's an example. Um, so we can have an invariant on class company and we can say self.employee arrow select age greater than 50 arrow not empty. Now let's read that carefully. The arrow indicates that we're accessing properties of collections. So when you see an arrow in OCL it means that the thing to the left of the operation is to be interpreted as a collection. So self.employee is a collection. Now in this case we're not saying that class company has an attribute employee. We're talking probably about um, company being linked, being having, a, having an association to another class, perhaps employee. Um, and then self.employee is the collection of all objects of that class to which self is linked. Um, now, if you remember, um, in some lab we talk about properties. You'll see there's actually very little difference between um, an attribute of collection type and a collection of linked objects. But that's by the by. Anyway, we've got this self.employee, which is a collection of employee objects. Out of that collection, we select those objects which satisfy the bracketed constraint. In this case, the constraint is that the age is greater than 50. Now, that constraint, age greater than 50, is of course being in interpreted in the context of one of those objects. So now we're going into the employee object and we're saying we're looking for an attribute age in that employee object and the value of that attribute should be greater than 50. In this case that makes sense and is what you'd expect but do notice what's going on because this sort of shifting focus is an important aspect of how the interpretation of OCL constraints works. Okay, so now we've in, as if we go as from self.employee arrow select age greater than 50 what we've now got is a collection of employees and what we've got is those employees that are linked to this class com this object of class company and whose age is greater than 50 okay and now the arrow not empty says that that collection is not empty 
Okay. In other words, what we're saying is that some company must, is that every company must have some employee whose age is greater than fifty. Okay. Jolly good thing, if you ask me. We have some collections operations that return collections. Um, so you've just seen select. Um, so we've got we can select those elements of a collection that satisfy a Boolean expression, and we can also do the opposite. We can reject those ones satisfying a Boolean expression. And you might recognise this as filter from your Haskell course. Um, we can also collect the ones that satisfy the a given expression, which is a bit like map in functional programming. You'll read the details in the specification. Um, collect on a set gives you a bag. Think for a moment and satisfy yourself that that has to be the case, and indeed it is the case. Uh, you can convert between types of collections in the kind of obvious way. The commonest case of that is that you might want to take a collection, for example a bag, and you might want to look at it as a set, in other words deduplicate it. We can do emptiness checking, positively or negatively, pretty much as you'd expect. And we can use quantifiers, and they work like this for all and exists. And there are various syntactic variants of these which you'll find in the standard. Um, I'm just giving the simplest ones here. Here's one convenient variant, though. Um, if we want to be able to um, bind to instances um, of a collection, um, Here's a very common example. So we, if we want to say self.employee arrow for all, E1 and E2 of type person, E1 not equal to E2 implies E1's forename is not equal to E2's forename. In other words, we're saying that in this particular case, um, forename is going to act as a, as a key on the collection of employees. Um, notice that this basically implies that whatever the type of that um, self of the objects of that self dot employee collection is, um, it either is or can be regarded as being person. Otherwise, this wouldn't make sense. Um, it's it's optional to actually give that type colon person, but it's often convenient to do so for the reader. We have some collections operations that return numbers like sum and size. Um, notice that the sum will have to depend on the element type but it, this is pretty much in the obvious way. We've seen already that an OCL expression in the context of one class A might refer to an associated class B. Um, if we have uh, like a single association, so a something to one, then it's straightforward. We just use the dot notation and it, there's only one thing it can possibly mean. So suppose we have an association between a class student and a class advisor which indicates that the student is advised by this particular advisor. Now, there might be a role name on the advisor end of that association, perhaps it might be student advisor, and then we'll use that. And we can hop a couple of times around the diagram if we like, so we can go self.studentadvisor.name. And if you know you are the student concerned, then what that evaluates to is the name of your student advisor, who is, let's say, uniquely determined if you only have one student advisor. Sometimes there might not be a role name in the diagram. We've probably talked in labs about using you know, either role names or association names, but not both, and about how if you've got aggregations as your associations, you probably don't need to at all. So you can always just use the class name, but you lowercase it. Um, so self.advisor.name. Um, by the way, the fact that you lowercase it is a relatively recent addition to OCL, so you may also see non-lowercase examples, even in my own writing in some places. But what if the association isn't to one? So suppose we, for example, consider the same association, but from the point of view of the advisor, given that an advisor might advise many students. Well, we do what hopefully is kind of the obvious thing. Um, in this case, the role name, let's say advisee, um, refers to a set of students. So all the students who are advised by this particular advisee, all the students that are linked by the association to this particular advisor object. Um, and then we can use that as a collection, as you saw, in fact, right at the beginning, and we can apply, for example, for all constraints on it, or we can check that the set is not empty and so on. Um, OCL has a bunch of kind of convenience features, so for example, if you do use a collection operation on something that isn't a collection, it gets interpreted as a set containing one element, and usually all as well. Um, but try not to do that deliberately, because it might be confusing for the reader. 
We've already seen a little bit about what, when we take more than one hop around the class diagram. So suppose we go self.student.module. So self in this case, let's say, is advisor. Um, so I'm an advisor. I'm going to look at the set of all the students that I advise. And then each of those students is taking, let's say, a number of modules. Um, so what what's going to happen if I go self.student.module? It's deemed to be short for self.student arrow collect module. And in other words, what this amounts to is a bag of all the modules taken by the students who are linked to self. Okay, so we already covered that self.student is a collection of students, but now self.student.module um, is a bag. Why is it a bag? Because there might we might have several students who are taking the same course, and it, it just so happens in OCL that that information about the duplicate about the multiplicity of the elements is retained. If you don't want that, then you'll use the as the as set operation to bring it back to a set. Um, notice when you um, write constraints and you put them in a UML model, um, you are in effect um, introducing dependencies. So we try to make to ensure that dependencies don't kind of spread throughout the diagram, so that it's possible to modify one class without being forced to modify even kind of recompile or recheck everything in the diagram. OCL constraints impose dependencies just like um, links in a, in a diagram impose dependencies. So do be cognizant of that. Sometimes it can't be avoided. What about using operations in OCL? So I suppose we've got a, so we've talked about how to specify operations using using OCL. How about if we want to be able to refer to or use operations in OCL? Suppose we've got a register operation, our favourite operation, um, an operation of class module. Um, we've got a register operation that takes a, a student as argument. Um, should we be able to refer to that operation in an OCL expression? Well, the trouble is, if we do, um, then we've got a problem about what this really means, because the register operation, assuming it has its natural meaning, um, actually does something. It changes something. It alters the state of the module. and that really won't do because we would like our OCL constraints to be things which can be evaluated as many times as we like without making any difference. For example, we'd like to be able to you know, evaluate a class invariant um, whenever we like on objects of the class just to check that the objects of the class are still in a legal state. And, and everything's going to go completely haywire if when we do that the state of the object might actually change underneath us as a result of us doing the check. That's really bad. Um, so the only good way around this is to say that in OCL you can only refer to, use, operations that are guaranteed not to alter the state of any object. And those things are known as queries. Um, and in UML, an operation has an attribute is query. That is to say, the operation meta class in UML has an attribute is query. And the value of that attribute must be true for the operation to be legally used in an OCL expression. Um, if you're using a sophisticated OCL tool, then it will check. If you're using a less sophisticated OCL tool, then it may not, but it'll still be your job to make sure that that's the case. Just because you'll get nonsense if you start referring to operations that do have side effects inside your OCL expressions. We don't need much in the way of control structures because OCL is a constraint language and we're, we're using it for defining expressions and they'll usually be quite simple expressions. Um, we do have if then else ended by end if, um, and this is much the same way as you may have seen it in Haskell. So um, this is if something happens, then the value of an expression, else the value of an expression. It's not then do something, else do something else. And we've also got a let blah in blah um, piece of syntax. Surprisingly enough, there's no end let there, um, just for convenience. We don't usually need it, but that asymmetry of the syntax sometimes catches people out. And that's all I want to say, so now go and have a look at the spec.